everyone, this is Amy Johnson Crow, and welcome to this week's Archives.com live stream. We have St. Patrick's Day coming up this weekend, so of course Irish research is on our mind. So this week we are going to dance the Irish jig with Griffith's Valuation. Griffith's Valuation is one of those key sources that when you're researching your Irish ancestors, Griffith's Valuation is one of those sources that you definitely want to take a look at. So what is Griffith's Valuation? Well, its actual name is the Primary Valuation of Ireland. So why does everybody call it Griffith's Valuation? Because Sir Richard Griffith was in charge of it. And it's just easier to say Griffith's Valuation than to walk around all the time saying Primary Valuation of Ireland. So it's commonly referred to as Griffith's Valuation. And as you might guess from the title, either the official title or the unofficial title, it's actually property valuations. Think about your house and paying property taxes. The amount of tax that you pay is based on the value of the property. And that's what Griffith's valuation did. They went across Ireland seeking to establish the value of the different tenements or the different taxable properties in Ireland so that they would have the correct taxation placed upon them. Griffith's valuation was taken over a period of years. The first one was in 1848 all the way through 1864. So it does last for those 16 years, which it's a very important time period in Irish history, which is one of the reasons that Griffith's valuation is so important in Irish research because it covers the years during and immediately after the Great Famine. So when we see the potato crops have, have failed and we're seeing famine and we're starting to see a lot of, a lot of exodus from Ireland, Griffith's valuation is covering that time period. And it includes approximately 80% of Ireland's tenements. And again, a tenement being defined as a taxable property. So it's covering the vast majority of the taxable property in Ireland. And it serves as a census substitute because it was taken every year from 1848 to 1864, and it does cover so many properties, it serves as a very nice census substitute, which is especially important when you consider that the Irish censuses for this time period were destroyed. So we don't have an actual official census that we can use for this time period, but this makes a very nice substitute. But you need to remember that Griffith's valuation isn't a census. It's actually a tax record or a personal or a, a property valuation record. It's not, it, it wasn't intended to be a census. So when you go in, you're not going to find every member of the household listed. It's not going to be that, that census record that you might be used to, to using. Some important terms that you're going to want to know before you get into Griffith's valuation. The first is occupier. And this is a person who occupied the property. It was also the, the person who was responsible for paying the tax on the property. It's not necessarily the head of the household. So that's an important distinction. So the occupier is basically the person who would be responsible for paying the taxes on that property not necessarily the head of the household. Another term that you will see is immediate lessor. And this is who the occupier names as the one that they are leasing from. And the vast majority of tenements in Ireland were leased or they were rented. So who is this person who is occupying the land? Who are they leasing it from? That's this person. It's important to remember that that immediate lessor is not necessarily the owner of the land. It's not uncommon to see someone who is leasing a large piece of property and then turning around and leasing smaller pieces of it or leasing off houses that are on that property. So the immediate lessor is the person who holds that lease, the person 
who the occupier is leasing from, but not necessarily the owner of the land. Sometimes you'll see the term in fee. Now that indicates that the occupier owns the land. And another term that you will sometimes come across is representatives of, or sometimes abbreviated as reps of. Now this indicates that it's the heirs or the legal representative of the person named. So when you see this, it's a pretty good clue that that person who is named is deceased. So, you know, do we want to start looking for different court records, probate records, things like that? So that's, that's a clue that we want to follow up with other types of records. So what does Griffith's valuation look like? Well, here is the top part of a sample page. It's nice and printed. We don't have to worry about a lot of, you know, old handwriting to dig through. It's a printed document. So that makes our job a little bit easier when we're trying to read these old records. And it is set up in tables like this. This one happens to be from County Clare. And let's zoom in so we can see this a little bit better. Here on the, the left-hand portion of the page, you'll see a section number and letters of reference to a map. Now, a resource that is often used together with Griffith's valuation is something called the Ordnance Survey Maps. And that's what these numbers and letters refer to. So it's nothing that is specifically on Griffith's valuation, but it's a key back to the Ordnance Survey Map. So you can actually locate the property that's being taxed, which that's always cool. The numbers refer to the section on the map. The letters, as you see A, B, C, and D, here in this column, refer to buildings or to dwellings. And the farmer's house is indicated by italic letter A. The next thing you will see is the name of the townlands and the occupiers. So here we have the name of the townland, which is Kiladary, and the name of the occupiers. Again, these are the people that would be taxed on this property, not necessarily the head of the household. In the next column, we have those immediate lessors that I was talking about. And you might have noticed that on this page, John Bentley is listed as both an occupier and a lessor, which that indicates that he is leasing property, in this case from Sir Hugh Massey, and then he is turning around and leasing property then to these three individuals. So this is not an uncommon situation. You see this fairly regularly. The next column is a description of the tenement. You will see terms like house, which house can be either a residence or a public place, such as a church or a tavern. You'll often see the term office, and that just means place of work. It doesn't necessarily mean business. It could be a business, but it could also be a barn or a mill or a stable. So those two terms are, are pretty important to remember, house and office. Moving to the right-hand side of the page, you'll see columns with a whole bunch of numbers in it. The first column is area, and it shows the size of the land listed in acres, roods, and perches. And as we can see, this first property, he had 165 acres, one rood, and 32 perches. So that's a pretty sizable piece of property. And then the next three columns are the net annual value, which this is what the assessor has figured out that this property should bring in. This, this is what this property would be expected to bring in on an annual basis. And it's divided between land, buildings, and then a column totaling the, the land and building value together. So let's take a look at some examples from Griffith's valuation. Now remember how we saw before we had the numbers that were on the map. We had the numbers and then the letters. 
What's important to remember that when you're working in the country, those numbers that are over on that very left-hand column, it simply refers to the section on the map. It doesn't in this case mean that Michael O'Brien, Michael Maloney, and Edmund McNamara were next door neighbors. It's just how the map was laid out and how the map was numbered, that they were in numbers one, two, and three. Okay, so that's, that's important to remember. Always look at that tenement description for context. So you'll usually see things like house, office, land. But sometimes you'll see something like this that we have here in Thomas Butterfield's listing. He had a, herd, a herdman's house, office, and land, as well as an orchard. So, you know, again, it, it's not a record that's telling you mother's maiden name in this case, but it is giving a little bit of context as to the property that Thomas Butterfield was occupying. Okay, word of the day, agnomens. An agnomen is simply an additional name. And it's the term that Griffith's valuation used when they were adding something to differentiate between two people or, or more people with the same name. They wanted to make sure that they were accounting for individuals. Probably the most common agnomen that you'll see as you might expect, senior and junior. So on this particular page, we have Stephen Motherway Sr., another listing for Stephen Motherway Sr., and a listing down here for Stephen Motherway Jr. What's important to remember is that senior and junior doesn't necessarily mean father and son. It could be father and son, but it could be grandfather and grandson, it could be uncle and nephew. It could be two men who just happen to have the same name and seniors, the older one and juniors, the younger one. So take it as a clue, but don't walk away thinking, oh, I've automatically found the father because here I have senior and junior. Okay, just take it as a clue. Another agnomen that you will see in Griffith's valuation, here we have three different men named Dennis Sullivan. We have Dennis Sullivan with Philip, Dennis Sullivan, Daniel, and down here, Dennis Sullivan, Eugene. Now, when a name is in parentheses like this, it is often the name of the father. It isn't always, but it often is. And you can also take this as a clue. Could Philip and Daniel and Eugene, could they be brothers, which would make these three Dennis's cousins, and they're all named for their grandfather, Dennis. Again, we don't know that from this record, but it's a good clue, and it's something that we should watch out for and be on the lookout for with other records, like church records or things like that. But this is a very strong indication, if nothing else, that Eugene is the father of this Dennis, Daniel is the father of this one, and Philip is the father of this one. So we do have three different Dennis Sullivans all living in the same town. Sometimes you'll see residents listed as an agnomen, again, as a way to differentiate between two people of the same name. So here we have the occupier, James Morris, who's listed as Bridge Street, and see here, we're actually, um, this is actually the valuation for West Street. So James Morris is actually living in Bridge Street, and it's not the same James Morris that he's paying his lease to. That James Morris is of Valley Walter. So he's of a completely different town. But again, we're seeing residences as a way to differentiate between people the same name. There are other things that we can also find in Griffith's valuation. Sometimes you will see listings like, like we have here in house number three, Patrick Cody and brother. Of course, we wish they would have named Patrick Cody's brother, but at least we know that Patrick Cody is here in this town and his brother is there with him. So again, another clue that we can add when we're 
working on this family. Now, remember how I said before that when you're in the country and you have the numbers that are all the way over here on the left? Well, here we're in a town. We're actually in a small city. And we don't have large sections of the map numbered. We actually have the houses numbered. And the indication that we are here on West Street. And in this case, the numbers do indicate the houses in order. So John Phelan is living next door to George Lowe. Another type of agnomen that you will sometimes see is occupation. Somewhere in this town, there is another man named John Callahan. So the person who was putting this list together decided that this John Callahan is the one who's the blacksmith. That's how we're going to tell these John Callahans apart. The blacksmith and perhaps the other one was a minister or something like that. So searching in Griffith's valuation. Okay, we've taken a look at some examples. How do we find them? How do we go in and search them? For archives.com members, go into, when you log in, go into the search tab. And instead of searching all records, click the drop down and go and select census records. And then you can enter the, the first name, the last name, but be certain if you want to narrow it down to Griffith's valuation, go to this section here for location. And instead of, collect, instead of searching in all United States, hit the drop down and scroll to Ireland. Now, what I suggest, and I highly, highly recommend that when you're working in Griffith's valuation, make sure that you have some idea first of what part of Ireland they were in. Doing a search, let's say that you're researching John Kelly. If you don't have it narrowed down to, to a county, you know, you're going to be going through a whole lot of records. So I highly recommend that you select a county so that you can narrow it down uh, so you can have more meaningful results without having to go through, you know, two or 3,000 John Kellys. So select that county. And I was doing a search for John Tracy in County Galway. And this is one of the records that came up. So we have his name and the notation here that he is the occupier. When you do a search, it will pull up both occupiers and lessors. So in this case, John Tracy is the occupier. We have the date here, 1855. It's a normal entry. And as I said a moment ago, County Galway. And then the very specific, you know, he's in the Union of Tome, the parish of Monavia, and the townland of Corifarine and information or the, the name of the lessor. What you'll want to do, of course, is to go over and view the image. This is just the, the abstract. You're gonna to wanna to go in and view the actual image. So when we click here, it'll bring up that page in question. And just like we expected, then there's John Tracy, as we expected, as one of the occupiers in, in this town. And we have the rest of the record as we expected. So a real quick tour of Griffith's valuation. As I said a moment ago, it's not a census. So you're not going to find everyone in the household listed by name, but it is going to put people in a specific time, at a specific place at a specific time, which I'm a big fan of timelines. And I have always believed that the more points you can put on someone's timeline, the better research that you have. And the context that it gives you, what type of land that they were, that, that they were leasing, the value of it. You know, you can go in and compare, you know, okay, you know, my guy had 11 acres of land and it's only worth this much. Well, one of his neighbors had 10 or 11 acres of land and it was worth a lot more. Well, you know, perhaps 
my guy had, you know, very rocky soil and he couldn't farm it, or, you know, there was something about the land that made it less valuable. So you can kind of get a good context for your ancestors by going in to Griffith's valuation and comparing them to their neighbors. You know, were they normal or were they abnormal? Well, let's say typical and atypical. We'll put it that way. And speaking of timelines, our live stream video next week will be the time of their lives, discovering your ancestors with timelines. So we're gonna take a look at a tool that you can use to find holes in your research and give you some ideas for additional research. So uh, definitely come back next Wednesday, March the 20th at the same time, one o'clock Eastern, 10 o'clock Pacific. We hope to see you there. And as always, to stay up to date with everything that's happening with archives.com, make sure you check out our blog. Uh, definitely like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and all of the live stream videos that we have been doing are up on the archives.com YouTube channel. So for those of you who are, are watching live and you want to see what we've done in the past, head on over to the YouTube channel and you can see everything that we have been doing for the last few weeks. And we've got, got some good videos up there. Hope that you enjoy them. That's it for me this week. Again, this is Amy Johnson Crow. I hope that you can join us next week, either here on the, uh, the live stream as it's happening or uh, after the live stream, after it gets uh, posted up to YouTube. Uh, I, for those of you who are watching live, I will be popping over to the chat room just momentarily to answer a few questions that you might have. Again, I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, happy researching.